Hey everybody, in today's video, we're going to take a look at the SpaceCat 61mm telescope from Lilium Optics. This is the same thing as the RedCat telescope, which you're probably more familiar with, but it has that great color scheme, and it also includes a special little surprise in the box. I should mention that William Optics sent me this telescope to review, but they're not sponsoring the video. In addition to that, this is an updated review. Because in the original version, I had a coupon code that could save you $100 off any CAT telescope. The only problem was, William Optics did not honor that discount, and they subsequently changed it to $50 rather than the $100 that they promised. In addition to that, if you purchase directly from William Optics, I think they're charging some sort of export fee, or so I hear. For these reasons, I would only recommend buying a telescope from William Optics via one of the online retailers like Agena Astro. You won't get any discounts, but at least you're going to get the product in a reasonable amount of time with no weird export fees that are passed on to you, which should never happen. I want to apologize if you ran into any problems over the past week since the review went live, but that's why I'm creating this updated video. That way it doesn't happen to anybody else. Anyway, the first thing I want to do is cover the specs of the Space Cat or the Red Cat 61. That way you know if this is the right telescope for you or not. Then we'll get to the more fun stuff. Why don't we just start off right here at the top with the price. The Space Cat 61 retails for $1,700. But you can save $200 right off the bat just by getting the Red Cat version instead. And that's what I'd recommend for most people. Unless you really want that great color scheme and that little cat. If you don't want to spend that much money though, consider getting the Red Cat 51 instead. The new WIFD version is really nice and it costs just $900. And in fact, when I was first getting into astrophotography about five years ago, my very first telescope was the original Red Cat 51. I'm still a huge fan of that telescope, but now that we have the new version with the built-in focuser, this is much, much better. And to be honest, I'm probably going to buy this newer version just because the focuser makes my life so much easier. There is one other Red Cat available, that's the Red Cat 71, and this retails for $1,800. And if we take a look at all the telescopes they have, for the Red Cat series anyway, we start off at the low end with the Red Cat 51. This has 250 millimeters. The Red Cat 61 has 300 millimeters. And then the Red Cat 71 has 350 millimeters. As you move up from one Red Cat to the next, the focal length goes up 50 millimeters, but the aperture stays the same at f4.9. And that brings us to the next specification, which is the focal length. As I said, the Space Cat 61, which we're reviewing today, is 300 millimeters. And this can either be a good focal length or a bad focal length, depending on the camera that you have and what you want to photograph. This is why I recommend in my Deep Space course that you use a free website called Telescopius. With Telescopius.com, you can search for any target that you want to photograph. Let's say, I don't know, why don't we just start off with Orion to keep it simple. Then we scroll down to the Sky Atlas over here. The photo's blown out, but you still get the general idea. So if we're using the Space Cat 61 or the Red Cat, that's 300 millimeters. I could adjust the aperture, but I'm really not worried about it. It won't change anything. And then for the camera sensor size, this is something you'll need to figure out on your own. I'll be using the ASI 2600 camera, which has an APS-C, which is about 23.4 millimeters by 15.9. If you're not sure though, just Google your camera sensor and find this information. Now that you've got the camera sensor and the focal length dialed in, you can see what the targets will look like before you buy that telescope. And at least for Orion, I think this is a great focal length, 300 millimeters. I can also do the Horsehead Nebula, which is right nearby. Let's try another target, maybe the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. This is another target that would fit nicely in the field of view for the Space Cat 61. But let's look at something maybe a bit smaller, like Thor's helmet. With Thor's helmet, it's much smaller, and in fact, you probably won't even see it with this focal length. I mean, it's there, but when you finally crop it in, it's not gonna look all that great. So what I would do in this case is find the focal length that actually works. Maybe, I don't know, 800 millimeters? That's certainly a lot better, but I could go even further. Let's say 1200. That's about what I'd like to see. Now I know for Thor's helmet in my camera, I need to purchase a 1200 millimeter telescope. So what I'd like you to do before you purchase any new gear 
is use telescopius.com, find a list of targets that you'd like to photograph, and see what focal lengths work best. Again, the CAT series go from 250, 300, to 350. Getting back to the specs, 300 millimeters is pretty good for my particular camera and what I want to photograph. The diameter is 61 millimeters, that's fine. And the aperture is f4.9. I would say that's fairly good for most telescopes because once you get above f5.6 to like f8 or f10 or worse, then it's going to take exponentially longer to capture a decent final image. And this involves a lot of math, but the simple way to think about it is at f4.9, if I took maybe eight hours worth of data and I got a nice looking photo, I would need to capture upwards of 16 or even 32 hours of data for an equally clean photo from an f8 or an f10 telescope. Point being, f4.9 is pretty good. Another thing to note is that with all of the CAT telescopes, there's no flattener required, which makes the setup process much easier. You just take your adapters, attach it to the camera, screw it all together, and you're ready to go. And to be honest, this is actually one of the best features of these telescopes because it really does simplify everything at night, especially if you need to take flat frames or you just don't want to deal with the extenders and the flatteners and everything else. The Space Cat 61 does weigh about 7.7 .7 pounds, so it's fairly heavy, I must say. And in terms of the overall size, it is fairly long. That is something I miss about my original Space Cat 51. That telescope had a reversible lens hood, which made it even more compact. And I could easily take that on top of a mountain and shoot if that's what I wanted to do. With the Cat 61 though, I would say it's too big to take on any hikes. So this is going to be more of your car camping or backyard telescope. Speaking of which, the carrying case of the Space Cat 61 is much larger as well than the older Red Cat 51. But it does have enough foam inside that it should keep it safe as you take it out to those dark skies. Alright, that's the boring stuff out of the way. We've talked about the Space Cat 61 specs, and we've also compared it to the other Cat series of telescopes. As I said earlier, if you're looking to save some money, go for the Red Cat 51 if 250mm is a good focal length for you. If you want a bit more zoom though at 350 millimeters, consider the Red Cat 71 instead. Just remember this is going to be considerably larger and heavier than both the 51 and the 61. Let's take the telescope outside next and take a look at how it performs. I'm going to start off by attaching my camera to the Space Cat 61. And because I'm using a color camera, I can easily install a 2 inch filter inside the telescope. This is true for any Cat telescope. What you want to do is just unscrew this piece with the deep grooves, take your 2 inch filter, screw it right in, and then attach everything back to the telescope. It's that easy. And you don't have to worry about having a filter drawer or anything else. Then I'll take my two spacers along with the adapter ring and attach that to the back of the filter thread here. I will be using the 2600 Air camera today, which you might not have heard of yet, but this is something coming out from CWL in the near future. And it should make things simpler tonight because the ASIR is built into the camera. But there we go. My camera is attached in just a few seconds and I'm ready to shoot. Next, I'll bring everything outside to my mount, which is the ZWO AM5N, that's the new version. And it should just slide right into the dovetail plate, like so. One of the cool things with the CAT telescopes is that they all have this built in Badnov mask on a lens cap, and that makes focusing much easier. Now I want to take a look at the focusing system on the CAT61. This is William Optics internal focuser, which is their latest invention, and I gotta say it's way better than that old focus ring that they used to have on the Red Cat 51. The issue with that older focus ring is you could just barely touch it, and then when you take your test photo, your stars are blurry. But with this new focus ring, even using the rough focus adjustment, it's super precise. And in fact, I haven't even felt the need to use the fine precision knob, which is also available. So if you're like me, and you have the older Red Cat 51 and you're looking for something new, I honestly believe the new focuser makes this a compelling choice. It really does make your night much more enjoyable. And the great thing is, once you get your focus dialed in, you can just leave it here, and it should stay consistent from night to night. Although, if the temperature drops a lot at night, you'll likely need to refocus. And speaking of temperature, they actually put a temperature gauge on the side of the focus knob. I don't really see the benefit of that. I mean, it's nice to see it, but you can always just use your phone to see the temperature. I did want to talk about the lens hood for a minute because on my original Red Cat 51, you could actually unscrew this, reverse it, 
and then that made the entire setup more portable. But with this one, while you can take it off, I don't recommend it. It makes the entire telescope feel more exposed and more prone to being damaged, and you're better off just leaving the lens hood on all the time. To be honest, there's really not much more to talk about in terms of the design and use of the SpaceCat 61. And that's a great thing, because it's simple and easy to use. You don't have to screw around with a flattener and try to get the back focus perfect. You don't have to mess with an unreliable focus ring. This telescope is built for the beginner like myself who just wants an easy night. Now that you've seen how this telescope works out in the field, let's take a look at some of the photos I've captured over the last few months. For the image analysis, we're going to use four different photos that I captured back in May from Kanab, Utah. These were taken in a Bortle 2, and the exposure time ranges anywhere from like an hour, at the worst case scenario, to maybe three or four hours at best. No more than that though. All of these photos were stacked using PixInsight with just the light frames. There were no calibration frames whatsoever, so no flats, darks, or bias. This should allow us to see any imperfections with the telescope, especially in terms of the vignette. Also, this was a crop sensor camera, so if you have a full frame camera, you might see more of the vignetting towards the edges, so keep that in mind. Anyway, that's enough of the disclaimer. Let's actually take a look at our first photo. We have the Dark Shark Nebula, and these will all be linked down below. If you want to take your own look, feel free. But when I zoom into the center, the stars are fairly sharp. I will say I was having all kinds of problems personally when I was doing this photo shoot uh, for all these images. On multiple nights, I forgot critical components, which meant I couldn't guide, and that led to all kinds of issues. My point here is just that if I were to go out and shoot tomorrow night, I would likely get much sharper stars with a more controlled situation. The good thing is though, because the CAT series have a pet's fall design, that means the stars should be sharp from corner to corner. And if we were to take a look at the lower left corner, for example, we're not really seeing too much of that streaking aberration. There is a slight amount, but nothing too bad. The same would be true in the upper left corner, lower right, upper right, etc. And the nice thing is, even if you miss your focus a little bit, or you have a little bit of trailing, Blur Exterminator will save the day. And that's why I always recommend you start off by running correct only on your photos to get those stars nice and sharp. So the main problem I have with this image is just that the bottom portion is unnaturally dark. And I've seen this with my older SpaceCat 51 as well from like five years ago. I've never been quite sure what exactly is the cause because if it's a traditional vignette, you would expect to see a dark corner around all the edges, but it's always centered on like one part of the frame. And if we were to take a look at the blue horse head, you'd kind of get the same idea where part of the photo is darker than the rest. This could just be the fact that that part of space is darker, but like I said, there seems to be just some natural vignette to these telescopes, which could be fixed if I took flat frames. Keep that in mind. And in terms of the star sharpness, these photos are a bit more blurry for the blue horse head. I did not get the focus perfect. That's due to user error, so make of that what you will. In terms of the exposure time, this was about two and a half hours or so for the blue horse head, and there's very minimal grain actually, which is nice. That f4.9 aperture does let a lot of light into the camera, especially if you get out to a dark sky. That also helps. Moving on to the Caspa Nebula. This is a fun target if you're far enough south. It's very low on the horizon, but I was still able to pull this off, and I had about two hours of data for this one. But we're not necessarily seeing that dark corner that we noticed on the other two images. This one appears to be fairly flat from side to side. And in terms of the star sharpness, there is a bit of streaking, because on this night I actually forgot my auto guider and I had to just go without it, which was kind of a pain. Finally, we have the Lagoon Nebula. And this one probably has some slightly soft stars as well, mainly due to me not double checking the focus when I should have. And that's the thing, you can go out and buy the best telescope in the world for let's say $10,000, but if you're not on top of everything, then you're not gonna get the best results out of that gear. So that's an important lesson to learn that Really what it comes down to is your commitment to the hobby and how much effort you want to put in there in the middle of the night to get the best possible results. I still need to improve on that myself. Now that you've seen the raw, unedited photos, let me show you what I was able to do with a bit of processing. And if you want to see how to do this yourself, check out my Deep Space course. There's over 80 videos with a strong focus on post-processing. We use a combination of both Photoshop and PixInsight to get the best possible results. For more information, Check the link down below. 
My favorite photo by far is this mosaic of Ro Ofuyuki. This was actually a real pain to capture, but I did create a YouTube video if you want to see how I did it. I think this provides a clear example though of just what the Space Cat 61 is capable of. All right, well, I think I've gone on long enough today. I hope this information helps you make a more informed decision when you buy your next telescope. The main takeaway for me is that the Space Cat 61 is easy to use, the new focusing system is fantastic, and a nice upgrade from the original focus ring. The telescope itself is fairly portable, and you can take it to dark skies no problem, although I will say it could be more compact like the original Red Cat 51 was. And provided you're not lazy and you get that focus dialed in perfectly, the images are quite sharp with minimal star distortion and vignette. And based on what I've seen with the Space Cat 61, I'd highly recommend the Red Cat 51 WIFD version as well as the Red Cat 71 WIFD. These are big improvements over the original variants of those telescopes. All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in another video.